Thank you guys for leading us so well. And uh, great cross-reference passages as well is really a fantastic choice of passages to read from for tonight. So we'll be in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, verses 4 through 8. Verses 4 through 8 we're going to cover tonight, which is uh, uh, the greeting here uh, to the seven churches. So last week, as we gave an introduction to this prophecy, to this revelation, uh, we talked about how God has revealed to John what will happen in the end, which when heard and obeyed, it blesses the one who trusts in Christ alone. So now as we dive into this greeting to the seven churches, this is the main idea of this passage, okay? This is what I believe the main idea of this passage is. The sovereign Lord, the Almighty, is coming again. And His entire mission in salvation history is coming to culmination in the last days. I think that's the main idea of this passage. And we're going to walk through... Uh, what, this, what this looks like, in particular in this passage uh, about salvation history and God's sovereign plan. So who are the seven churches being greeted? Maybe you've read Revelation before, maybe you haven't. I don't know if that was me on the cable there. Um, but uh, m- maybe you haven't. Well, if you haven't, here are the seven churches by name. Uh, did that image also work that I sent you to yeah. put up? Okay. Why don't, you, why don't you put the image up and you can go back to main idea? It's kind of stretched. It's okay. But hey, so we have these seven churches that are, if you don't know where this is, this is modern-day Turkey, what they consider to be Asia or Asia Minor, okay? You have Pergamum up top, you have Thyatira, Sardis, Philadelphia, Smyrna, Ephesus, and Laodicea. And those are the seven churches being addressed in, uh, the, in, in the book of Revelation, okay? Uh, and these seven churches, you know, you can see there obviously there seems to be some sort of close proximity to all of them. Uh, and there are obviously other churches besides these seven in that time, but also Paul, John was exiled right off the coast there, the island, island of Patmos, in his exile, and um, he, we do know that John was in Asia Minor near the end of his life, so uh, there could be a, a very important purpose and reason as to that. We don't know the full details why it's only those seven. It could be because there is some bit of numerology, or, not, or in the sense of a biblical way of numbering, you know, so seven is a symbol for the number of completion, you know, and so there might be some sense of that here. Uh, We could, we might be able to see some symbolism moving forward as we, as we go through this book, but uh, that could be the case. So John is writing directly to them because the Spirit of God is addressing them through this vision of prophetic letter. So let's break down this greeting. Uh, Verse four, uh, John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was and who is to come and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. So right in the get-go here in this greeting, John, once again, his name is brought back, but then we have here this word grace. Now, if you're very familiar with reading epistles, right, you're, you're pretty familiar that Paul opens up with saying things like this. This is John, of course, but he'll say grace and mercy, or grace and peace, or grace, mercy, and peace. You kind of hear all three sometimes. Now, this, this Greek word for grace is the word charis, and it's very similar to the word for greeting, it's, which is charain. And so you can see how they're somewhat similar, but notice in Christianity what you see Paul doing, establishing here, which I, which I think this is the first time in history you see a greeting like this, that, that being a greeting of grace. It's a reminder of what God has done. That's the type of greeting they're giving. Uh, grace is God's undeserved favor. It's his undeserved kindness toward us. It's something you can't earn. Uh, There's a really helpful acrostic I like to use. Maybe you've heard this before. God's riches at Christ's expense. God's riches at Christ's expense. I think it's a really helpful way to remember what grace is. It's God richly pouring out his love on us, but it's at the expense of Christ. He had to die. He gave his life uh, for us. So um, it is a greeting that's meant to, I think also, we would say, encapsulate the entire theme of the Christian life. Uh, It's one of grace. So there's another word he uses in this intro. It's in peace. Now, peace is a really common word. Uh, Remember in the Old Testament, that's the word shalom uh, is that word. Here in the New Testament, it's the word irene, where we get the name Irene. If you know a friend named Irene, say, hey, I know what your name means. It means peace. Um, So um, peace, it it, it has this idea of completeness or wholeness um, in the sense of things are finished and are are, are at rest. And it has a very um, really powerful meaning. You think about Romans chapter 5, verse 1. This word peace is used in the context here. It says, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, what do we have? We have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Justification by faith 
brings us peace. It brings us peace in our relationship with God. It's at rest. Now, notice the order here. I think the order is significant, too. Notice it's not peace and grace to you. It's grace and peace. I don't think that's an accident in Scripture. You have to experience God's grace in your life first before you can receive the peace of God in your life. You're not going to have the peace of God apart from the grace of God in your life. So notice the source of this grace and peace in the life of the believer. This source is God. Now notice, I don't know if you noticed this in the text, maybe you didn't, but this is a Trinitarian greeting. You see the Father, the Spirit, and the Son in that order. The Father, the Spirit, and the Son. Now, um, if, we, if we dive into this and we really look closely, breaking this down, let's, let's go through each one, the Father. Notice right here in the beginning, you might be saying, well, what if it's Jesus? Well, it says, from him who is and he was and who is to come. So it could be Jesus, but Jesus is already mentioned to, in, in the next verse. So why would he repeat Jesus again here? Um, people say this is actually, um, it's really actually awkward Greek. Uh, if you're looking at this Greek, some people have even argued that this is um, not original. Some people say it's been added to the scriptures. Th- those who are liberal scholars would, would say that. So um, we know it's the Father because this is actually an, an instance of a tetragrammaton, which is, you know, Yahweh, um, kind of like in the Old Testament, I am who I am. This is an undeclinable proper name. If you know the word declension, you know, who, who here took Latin or Greek? Homeschoolers here? Okay, cool. Got a few of you. So, you know, you have to do declensions and declining verbs and nouns and breaking these kind of things down, right? Well, this is an undeclinable proper name. You can't break it down grammatically like you would a normal name. So, um, to summarize all the geeky stuff, okay? What is happening here is that there are limitations for the Greek words I am in this passage, the way it's trying to be communicated. Notice it's who is. So it's present tense right now. God is. And that's why when he says, I am who I am in Yahweh in the Old Testament, it's related. Yeah, Luke? Yeah. When I was doing, uh, looking for some cross-references for this, uh, this uh, passage, I found, ex- like, one that came up with Exodus 3. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so it's, it's strongly related. So uh, it says, who is and who was, so it's obviously past tense, but who is to come. So it, the sense that God is over all time and over, over everything. And so this obviously heightens the, the fact and the focus for them of the imminence of Christ's coming. He, in other words, another way to say who is to come is he who is already on his way may arrive at any moment. That's a way to really think about that. So we see the Father. Grace and peace comes from the Father who is, who was, and who is to come. But it also comes from the seven spirits who are before his throne. Now, multiple views have come out on this phrase. And so I'm going to just summarize the five of them, Okay. There's five views. One thing, it's a, a, that, that it's a reference to angels. So seven spirits, seven angels, right? It kinda, you can kind of see that. You know, an angel is a spirit. So that might be one view. Some say they see Babylonian astrological influence in the text. And the seven spirits are representing the five known planets plus moon and stars. Uh, or moon and sun. I think it's a little wacko in my opinion, but that's what some people think. Um, a third perspective assigns the reference to the Holy Spirit based on Isaiah 11, 2 through 3, where the promised branch, Jesus, is endowed with the Spirit. Many people think that one. Uh, some who also advocate for this verse uh, uh, to reference the Holy Spirit in Isaiah, um, they also, some of them actually turn to Zechariah and say, well, it's not Isaiah. They dis- we disagree with about that, but when we look at this verse, we do think it's the Spirit, but really not out of Isaiah, but out of Zechariah. And that's Zechariah chapter 4, 2 through 6. We'll look at that in a second. And then the final view sees this as an interpolation, meaning it, it wasn't original, it was inserted into the text. So if you can't tell already, my view is the fourth one, which is Zechariah 4, 2 through 6. Now, you can turn in your Bible if you want. I'll go ahead and read it for us. Zechariah 4, 2 through 6. And it says, And he said to me, What do you see? I said, I see and behold a lampstand, all of gold, with a bowl on the top of it, and seven lamps on it, with seven lips on each of the lamps that are on top of it. And there are two olive trees by it, one on the right of the bowl and the other on its left. And I said to the angel who talked with me, What are these, my lord? Then the angel who talked with me answered to me, Do you not know what these are? I said, No, my lord. Then he said to me, This is the word of the Lord to Zerubbabel, not by might, nor by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord of hosts. So notice the association with these, these golden lampstands and lamps um, and then the Spirit of God. Uh, I think there's a, actually a strong connection between this imagery that you see here in this passage 
Uh, and also, uh, it, I would say it's an Old Testament allusion. There's a ton of those in Revelation. Revelation is full of allusions from the Old Testament. And I think this is one of the very first you see, especially out of Zechariah chapter 4. And we're going to have more uh, from Zechariah even in this text today. So um, one of my commentaries actually said this. It said, The revelator is thoroughly familiar with the Old Testament and uses this verse as the ideal identification for the Holy Spirit. Zechariah has provided the author of the Apocalypse with the perfect picture of the ministry of the Holy Spirit to the seven congregations to whom the prophecy is addressed. While there is but one Holy Spirit, he does not invest himself incrementally in the churches, but is always available simultaneously in his fullness to all seven congregations. I thought that was a really beautiful way to put it. I'm really thinking about the role of the Holy Spirit in the life of the church. Now we move on from the Father and the Son, or Father and the Spirit, now to the Son. And notice grace and peace come to them from two persons of the Trinity so far, and then also the third. And this one goes into even greater description. It says, from Jesus Christ the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. So we're going to break down each of those here. But this is obviously a clear reference to Jesus as the Christ, the second person of the Trinity. So this, this greeting being done in a Trinitarian manner, we see it's vitally important to the church because God is revealing himself as Trinity. We don't see this ever in a greeting. This is the only greeting in the New Testament that's Trinitarian. The only greeting in the New Testament is Trinitarian. There are other things in the New Testament that are Trinitarian, but this is the only greeting. So we look at this, and um, we find this revelation which is pointing forward to and through a great tribulation for these churches. Which he's, it's really trying to help paint the perspective of God, because grace and peace is coming to them from all three persons of the Godhead. So it is vital that they receive this revelation from God and in, in his fullness. So God is fully involved. His entire being is invested in the work and revelation of these mysteries. So let's look at Jesus in particular. We see three, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler of kings on earth. And really, I think it breaks down pretty well to prophet, priest, and king. Prophet, priest, and king, which are the roles that Christ takes. Uh, and so the first one, let's break down Jesus as our prophet. He's the faithful witness. Remember, this revelation is from Jesus as well. Back in what, uh, this is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then it says, um, this is, yeah, it's from Christ in that same passage in the very beginning in the intro. So Jesus as a witness, as a faithful witness, it's saying that he's, if we ever call someone faithful, like, hey, that's a faithful friend. There's someone who's dependable, right? There's someone you can rely upon, right? Well, Jesus is a faithful witness. He's someone who's absolutely dependable. And he's a faithful witness in the sense that he will appear to testify, and when he does so, he will only speak those things which are factual. He will give an account for things rightly. So his witness concerning the state of man, our state, is factual. His witness concerning the state of the seven churches that he's going to address, because if some of your Bibles, you might have the, you know, your, your ink in red for when Jesus talks, and you go to the seven churches, it's all in red, right? Because we understand contextually, this is Jesus talking to the churches, and so we know that his faithful witness to them, he's going to spiritually diagnose all of them, and he's going to be exactly correct. He's going to be fully reliable in addressing his churches as a faithful witness. He's a faithful witness concerning himself. He rightly communicates who he is to everyone. It's true. And his testimony concerning the future is also true. He's a faithful witness to that. So we see that as Jesus as our prophet. Now let's look at this phrase, the firstborn of the dead. Now we read Colossians. You guys remember when we read Colossians um, during, during the, the time there of worship uh, and, and singing and, and reading the text? We see really clearly um, from this Colossians passage, this is something that Paul uh, originally talked about, but it's obviously carried over to John as well. And what's really interesting, think about this. You're the firstborn of the dead. It's kind of a pretty jarring title, isn't it? I mean, think about it. Birth has this idea of life, right? Now, Jesus obviously wasn't, like, you know, coming into existence. That's not what firstborn means here. It means the first in rank, but it's still kind of a jarring title because death has a sense of finality to it, and firstborn has a sense of life to it. But it's, a, it's like a paradox. Um, they're, they're, birth and death are clearly antithetical to one another. But we, when we look at this, this firstborn of the dead, he's the one who is designated in rank above all else. Jesus ranks first. He's the first to rise from the dead in his, glor his glorified body, his glorified state. So, since he's the firstborn of the dead, this implies that there's going to be others, right? There's going to be others following after Christ. And what this means was, is really we're going to follow him in his resurrection. Those who trust in Christ will follow Christ in resurrection. 
Uh, I, I really love the way this one commentator put it. He just really, really broke this down in a very profound and moving way. And I just want to read this small excerpt about, um, about death. He talks about death here. And, and then Jesus says, the firstborn of the dead. Listen to this. Death is the tyrant that threatens all creation with irreplaceable loss and ultimate meaninglessness. But the one who brings this prophecy has dealt with death and rendered death helpless by becoming the firstborn from the dead. This metaphor is particularly arresting since normal life can only normally sorry, since normally life can only emerge from existing life. But here the witness is from one born not out of life or even out of nothingness, but out of death. He's the firstborn of the dead. So maybe you've lost someone in your life. At some point in your life, you've had a very difficult loss and you wish you could see or be with that person again, and it's hard. And you, you, you get the sense that that person that you cared about was irreplaceable. They, they, they kind of always kind of have that hole uh, that, that can't be filled, right? Uh, and, and I think that's true. When we lose people we love, they've had an Im- impact on our life. And that impact, while other people might be able to do the same in our life, it's not going to be the same. Now, it doesn't mean we can't make it through life, and it doesn't mean uh, ultimate meaninglessness is upon us, and and all those things, but it is sad. It's, it causes us to grieve. It causes us to, to wail and to mourn. And we, and we think about what Jesus did here as the firstborn of the dead. He looked at death, the tyrant, in the face, and he faced it. And what did he do? He rendered it completely helpless. He rendered it completely weak, and he destroyed it. He destroyed death. He is the destroyer of death. He is the victor. He is one. And we look at Christ and this, this firstborn of the dead, and it gives us hope as our priest. Because he, Jesus Christ, passed through the heavens. We think of Hebrews chapter 4. Turn your Bibles to Hebrews 4. And notice what, what um, the author of Hebrews says. Uh, Hebrews 4.14. Since then, we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold fast our confession, for we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who in every respect has been tempted as we are, yet without sin. Let us in with confidence draw near to the throne of grace, that we may receive mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus is our great high priest. Jesus is able to stand between us and the Father and be our mediator. He represents us. But then lastly, we see not only Jesus as our prophet, our priest, but we see him as our king. Notice the last phrase that going on to describe Jesus. It says, and ruler of kings on earth. This depicts Jesus as having great majesty as king. It brings to mind uh, passages like Psalm 2. You, everyone turn to Psalm 2. We look at Psalm chapter 2. This is what we would call a messianic psalm. Okay? It's, a, it's a psalm about the Christ or the anointed one who's a descendant of David. And, and notice in this psalm, it's only a few verses here. I think it's about 12 verses. Notice what it says. Why do the nations rage and the peoples plot in vain? The kings of the earth set themselves and the rulers take counsel together against the Lord and against his anointed, that's the Messiah, saying, let us burst their bonds apart and cast away their cords from us. So here's God's response. He who sits in the heavens laughs and the Lord holds them in derision. Then he will speak to them in his wrath and terrify them in his fury, saying, As for me, I have set my king on Zion, my holy hill. I will tell of the decree. And the Lord said to me, You are my son. Today I have begotten you. Ask of me, and I will make the nations your heritage, and the ends of the earth your possession. You shall break them with a rod of iron and dash them in pieces like a potter's vessel. Now therefore, O kings, be wise, be warned, O rulers of the earth. Serve the Lord with fear and rejoice with trembling. Kiss the Son, lest He be angry and you perish in the way, for His wrath is quickly kindled. Blessed are all who take refuge in Him. This Son is the Christ. This is the King of kings. He is the one who the nations rage against. But the Lord says to Him, The nations are your heritage. The end of the earth, your possession. You will break them with a rod of iron. You are the ruler, as going back to Revelation, you are the ruler of kings on earth. And we think of another passage, 2 Samuel chapter 7. Go to 2 Samuel 7 and look at verse 13. 
2 Samuel 7, 13 to 16. It says, He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be to him a father, and he shall be to me a son. When he commits iniquity, I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the son of men. But my steadfast love will not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. So this is Nathan speaking to David. This, this, uh, these words that God commanded Nathan to speak to him. And now notice, it's, it's a promise for David's house. And notice it says when he's commit, who, he will commit sin. It's any descendant who's a king will commit sin. And many kings who do follow David do end up sinning. Go read First, uh, Second Samuel, First, Second Kings, and go read First, Chron- Second Chronicles. You'll see a lot of their sins on display. But there's one. Remember, there's still a promise there. Their throne is established forever, forever, and Jesus is becomes the King who does not sin, whose throne is established forever. Psalm eighty nine, Psalm eighty nine twenty seven. After that, we're going to go to Psalm one hundred ten. Look at these different Psalms here. Um, this is going back to that language of firstborn, but it also goes back to this language of kings. Psalm 89, verse 27 and and 28. And I will make him the firstborn, the highest of the kings of the earth. My steadfast love I will keep for for him forever. And my covenant will stand firm for him. Actually, that next verse too. I will establish his offspring forever in his throne as the days of the heavens. So we think about that verse in that section. And then uh, turning to Psalm 110. Psalm 110 is actually also one of the most quoted psalms in the New Testament. And so is Psalm 2, the two that we read, having to do with Jesus' kingship, his lordship. Look at Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies your footstool. The Lord sends forth from Zion your mighty scepter. Rule in the midst of your enemies. Your people will offer themselves freely on the day of your power and holy garments from the womb of the morning The dew of your youth will be yours. The Lord has sworn and will not change his mind. You are a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord is at your right hand. He will shatter kings on the day of his wrath. He will execute judgment among the nations, filling them with corpses. He will shatter chiefs over the wide earth. He will drink from the brook by the way. Therefore, he will lift up his head. This king is mighty. This king is great. He is higher than any king on the earth, and he rules and he reigns. Jesus is our prophet. He's a faithful witness. He is our priest. He's the firstborn of the dead. He represents us, and he's the ruler of the kings of the earth. And so from the Father, the Spirit, and the Son, this greeting is given of grace and peace. It's only offered in Christ. So when one thinks about Jesus as the Christ, the King, it evokes these ideas of glory and grandeur, which, which I think this is exactly where he goes. He goes on to a, a type of benediction here, which further describes the work of Christ. Look at verse, the, the rest of verse 5. To him, so this is a benediction, to him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. We look at this, Jesus Jesus loves us, to him who loves us, and he has freed us. So he showed his love, right? Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love for us, that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And we think, how did he do it? Well, he freed us from our sins by his blood, and this really brings it in mind, Leviticus 17, 11, and this idea of this atoning sacrifice. Notice this verse, for the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. As I was wrapping up this sermon, I was listening to the kids' choir right above me, practicing nothing but the blood. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And look at the rest of this verse, verse 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it for you on the altar to make atonement. You know what atonement means, big theological word? It just means covering. It's a covering for you. This atonement is a covering, and and it's for your souls, for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement by the life. It is the blood that makes atonement by the life. And so when we see this, this imagery here, that he loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, that is the foundational basis of it all. And going back to Romans, actually, Romans chapter 5, 8 and 9, 
So I just quoted verse 8, but God shows his love for us. Now, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. But look at verse 9. Since therefore we have now been justified by his blood. There's his blood again. So God says you are declared righteous by the blood. By his blood. Much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. Jesus' is blood makes us righteous before the Father because it covers, it atones for the sin of our soul. It covers our sin. It wipes away our iniquity. God sets us free from being identified by our sin. We don't have to be identified by our sin anymore. He sets us free to be identified by his blood, by his love. And there's nothing at all in that text, either of these texts that we read that have anything to do with our effort, has only to do with what Christ has done. He's declared us righteous. He has cleaned us up. His blood made atonement. And it's a major theme in Revelation. You're going to see this over and over again. We are blameless before God because he loves us and he's freed us from our sins by his blood. And that paid for the wrath of God toward us. But it doesn't end at freedom from sin, because now we're given a significant task. Notice it starts at redemption first, and then our sanctification. What do we do now? To him who loves us and has freed us from our sins by his blood, verse 6, and made us a kingdom, priest to his God and Father. So we're a kingdom, and a kingdom has to have a king. And Jesus, being that king, ruling and reigning over us, he has given us an assignment, and that assignment is to be priests. That assignment is to serve him. And really, we see this best in a passage like 1 Peter chapter 2. I don't know if you're familiar with that passage. You can turn there with me. Uh, 1 Peter chapter 2, and it opens up talking about this idea of being a living stone. Uh, But we'll go ahead and start right there, verse 4, verse 4 of 1 Peter 2. It says, As you come to him, a living stone, rejected by men, but in the sight of God, chosen and precious, you yourselves like living stones are being built up as a spiritual house. Why? To be a holy priesthood. To offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe and for those who do not believe. The stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But listen to this. But you, you are a chosen race, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession that you, why? Here's the reason. Here's the reason we are a kingdom of priests to his God and Father right here. That you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. This idea of being in darkness is being enslaved. And that language in this text is that we were set free from our sins by his blood. Isn't that what Jesus said he came to do in, in Luke's gospel when he, opened, he opens up the scroll of Isaiah in the synagogue and he, he says, I came to proclaim liberty to the captives. That's what Jesus came to do. And if you're captured today, if you don't know Christ today, you are captured in your sin. And for those of you who know that don't know Christ, if you're a believer today, They are captive to their sin, and they are lost, and they are in darkness. And God wants to call them out of darkness into his, not just light, his marvelous light. And then verse 10 of 1 Peter 2. Once you were not a people. In other words, you were nobody. But now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. We think about what God has assigned to us. The task of being a part of his kingdom is to be his priests. Now, this is not about like a radical individualism, like, hey, now I can come to God. I don't have to go through a priest, right? This isn't about like, it's just me and Jesus now, right? Because we're a kingdom. So we're a community of people who are all priests who can come to God individually, but we come to God also as a community. And we're able to exercise our priesthood to serve God the Father. Think of Romans 12, 1 and 2, and it talks about, You know, it's our reasonable service, right? It's our spiritual worship, our reasonable service. Worship and services go together here. So we think about this 
Um, we're united together as a kingdom. And being a kingdom of priests, we serve the one who will receive all glory and dominion. That's where it goes, right? This benediction. And it talks about priest to his God and Father. To him be glory, weightiness, fame, and dominion. So he owns everything. Everything is his. And it's forever and ever. And then he says, Amen. Meaning, let it be so. This is the case. I agree with this. It's a, even in rejoicing. And we think of verse 7. Look at verse 7. Now he's getting the attention of, in, in the greeting. He's really wrapping things up here. He says, behold, look here. Hey, take notice of this. Behold, he is coming with the clouds. Now this phrase harkens back to Acts 1.11, which I think I mentioned last week. But Acts 1.11, it says this. It's these angels, these two men who stood by in white robes as Jesus had just ascended into heaven. And they say, men of Galilee, why do you stand looking into heaven? This Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will come in the same way as you saw him go into heaven. So he was taken up, as it said in verse 9, a a cloud took him out of their sight. And so it has this idea, this this language here of, of those clouds. It could be a reference to Daniel 7 about, you know, someone coming on the clouds of heaven. It could be that as well. Uh, But we see this imagery, at least as it relates to Revelation, and a mystery is being revealed. So behold, he is coming with the clouds. But notice where it goes. And every eye will see him. And every eye will see him. And even those who pierced him and all the tribes of the earth will wail on account of him. Even so, amen. So, in this passage, it's actually this one verse, there's, I think there's multiple references to the book of Zechariah. So you all can turn in your Bibles to Zechariah 12. We're going to look at a few verses right there in Zechariah 12. So um, someone read for me Zechariah 12.10. Who would like to read Zechariah 12.10? Okay, go ahead, read 12.10. And then someone read 12.12. The land will mourn every family by itself, the family of David's, the family of David's house by itself, and their women by themselves, the family of Nathan's house by itself, and their women by themselves. And then Rachel 12.14. So we see really clearly in this passage, in 12.10, talking about the house of David, that he's going to pour out in the house of David and the inhabitants of Jerusalem a spirit of grace and pleas for mercy, so that when they look on me, on him whom they have pierced. This is a prophecy of Jesus' crucifixion, but also of his return, because obviously he was pierced. And if you remember when Thomas um, saw Christ, you could see the nails in his side, the holes in his side, and the hands, but then the spear stab wound in his side that was visible so um it says they shall mourn for him as one mourns for an only child and weep bitterly over him as one who weeps over a firstborn so it goes on and it talks about each family mourning by themselves and and then verse 14 all the families that are left each by itself their wives by themselves and it has this idea of just wailing and mourning and weeping and i really think you see these these themes actually in the same section. Every eye will see him. They're going to look on him, even those who pierced him. But then all the tribes of the earth. So when it's breaking down all these tribes of the earth, it's like even families. It's breaking down all these tribes. And you go back and read that whole passage in Zechariah. It's mentioning all these tribes. And in doing that, he's saying, look, they're all going to wail on account of him. Maybe some of your translations say mourn uh, on account of him, because of him. Now, this could be a wailing um, most sc- uh, scholars would say this is a, a, a wailing of repentance, but it also could be a wailing of judgment. So they see him coming and they're like, I'm doomed. The wrath of God is upon me. This is clearly the King of kings and the Lord of lords. He's mighty. Um, but also could be a wailing of repentance and coming to him. So really the context of Zechariah 12, uh, by the way, I know we're not studying that whole passage tonight, but it's of the future repentance of the tribes of Israel in the day of the Lord. Or sorry, in the day the Lord restores Jerusalem and the nation to a place of supremacy. Okay? So, uh, verse 8. Let's look at verse 8. 
Verse 8, he goes on to say, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So if this was written to English-speaking people, would say, he would say, I am the A and the Z. So this is essentially a, a way in, to Greek-speaking people. He says, I am the first and the last. I am the beginning and the end. Right? It begins with me and it ends with me. That's a, it's a way in which he is trying to communicate the totality of who he is. And we see this, um, he repeats this in the end of Revelation, and specifically applying it to Jesus too. He says, Jesus says it in Revelation 22, 13. But then you go look at a passage like Isaiah 41, 4. In Isaiah 41, 4, he says, He who has performed and done this, calling the generations from the beginning, I, the Lord, the first, and with the last, I am he. So he's, he's saying, this is who I am. I am the first and the last. I've been there since the beginning. That's Jesus. So um, you might have noticed this phrase as well. This is what the Lord God says. And then it, once again, we see this phrase pop up. Who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. So really, it's really bookend on this greeting, isn't it? He is greeted with grace and peace from the one who is or who was and who is to come. And then at the very end here, it's wrapped up in that way again. I think that's clearly on purpose. Um, and in doing that, what this does is it, it, it affirms the fulfillment of this prophecy. God is intimately involved in this prophecy and in this greeting, and it's really showing how God is meticulous in this. You know, I wrote out the main idea of this statement, right? Obviously, that's not inspired, but this is my way of really trying to hone in what's going on in this passage. And I think what's going on is God is just meticulously involved in this prophecy and revelation. He's the sovereign Lord. He's the Almighty as this text ends, and he is so meticulously involved in this, in this prophecy. But reflecting on this, I'm a futurist when it comes to this text. I've been honest about that. Some of y'all don't think that. That's fine. There's a lot of differing opinions on eschatology, and even within this church. But when we think about it, when we think about it, um, even from a futurist perspective, some of these things have not happened yet, right? God is the God who is, who was, and who is to come. We can take such comfort in the sovereignty of God. Can we not? We, God knows what's going to happen tomorrow. He knows what's going to happen in 2022. He knows what's going to happen when you graduate, if you graduate. Sorry, no, sorry. Um, he knows what's going to happen. He knows what's going to happen down the road. I wasn't calling anyone out. Okay. Um, right? But he knows what's next. Everyone's like, I know, I know who he's talking about. No. Um, God knows what's next for you. God knows the next steps in your life. And, you know, those next steps, while they might be big for you, they're really small for him. Like, they really are. It's like, you know, I kind of look back on my life of, like, these big things happening in my life. Like, this is huge. And being like, wow, like, I'm, like, almost 33. Like, why did I freak out about that? You know what I mean? Like, uh, I remember one time I was like, man, I'm not going to be able to pay rent. I'm, like, freaking out. And I was at seminary. Well, what, are they going to kick me out the next day? Like, oh, you didn't pay rent, you heathen. Get out of here, right? And like, no, they probably wouldn't do that. Um, but I was really short on rent. Maybe you've heard the story before, but I was working at a restaurant. This college couple comes in. It's the last table of the night. I'm like, man, I'm going to get nothing out of these people, right? And uh, they spent $32. And they tipped me 50%, $16. I was like, that's what's up, but I'm still $80 short. Ah, you know, so I was like, it stinks. So anyway, um, you know, I'm all my sad self. I'm opening, whining at the back of the restaurant. Um, and um, the hostess brings up a little note. And on that note on the outside says Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding, Acknowledge him in all your ways, and he will keep your path straight. And within it was a $100 bill. I was just like, oh, I'll never judge college students like this again, right? So I don't judge you like that again, okay? Um, but I was, like, blown away. And I worked at that restaurant for three years. And my last week on the job, I hadn't seen them ever since that day. They came in. And I printed out a receipt. Just hit the button. It's like, mm, you know, coming out. And I wrote the longest letter I could on that little receipt of thanking them and giving the testimony of what that did in my life. And they thought I was handing them back the $100 bill <laughs> when I handed it because I rolled it up and handed it to them. And they're like, I'm, they're like, no, no, you keep it. I'm like, no, 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 there's no money in here. Like, thank you. Here you go. So, <laughs> trust me, I ain't giving that back. You know, I'm poor. <laughs> so, <laughs> and uh, it was just so cool. They, like, and I was serving them the whole time, and we didn't acknowledge it, but we both kind of knew. It was kind of like, it was really funny. Um, but I just remember, what I remember about that is, look, I'm just some, like, you know, 22 20, or 21-year-old guy at that time, working at this restaurant, not making a lot of money, and, like, out of nowhere, these people coming in on a Sunday night, 
probably have nothing better to do. They spend a hundred and nearly fifty dollars at a Tex-Mex restaurant to bless me. I mean, good night. It was such a, it was such a blessing, and I thought, man, this is huge. But for God, that was easy. That was easy. And we think about this, and we think about what's ahead. And maybe you look at the world around you, and you're like, like me, maybe you're frustrated by the the lies, the the COVID stuff, the politics, the just the economy, the, all this junk that you see out there. Maybe it frustrates you. I know it can frustrate me at times. But you know what gives me rest and peace to not give vent to the frustration I have? When I just rest knowing God is in control. When I rest knowing that he's sovereign over everything. He's the almighty. Like there's nothing we have to worry about. There's nothing we have to fret about. But we often do that because we can be foolish. We look at this as God is the almighty. Think about his power. Like, it's not, he's God some mighty, God a little mighty. Almighty. He's totally mighty. He is over everything. So we look at this book as a whole. We see God's judgments are going to be revealed as they're unfolded, and his promises are going to be fulfilled. And we're going to be reminded of the character of God. I talked about his sovereignty. He's meticulously involved in his creation. But we also see something beautiful in this passage. The triune mission of God. That all three persons of the Trinity are involved in, in the mission. And it, really, you see this in John's Gospel as well. Actually, a phenomenal book, if you ever want to read this. It's by Scott Swain and Andreas Kostenberger. It's called Father, Son, Spirit, the Trinity in John's Gospel. And the conclusion to this book talks about how the Trinity, through John's Gospel, is revealed to be on mission for God. Right? We see the Father. What does he do? He sends the Son. The Son obeys the mission of the Father to a T. And he, the Son, promises the sending of the Spirit, and the Father promises the sending of the Spirit as well. And then what happens? The Son returns to the Father, and the Father and the Son send the Spirit to do do what? Give us a task to go into all the world and proclaim the gospel. And he is with us and will be with us to the end until we return to the Father and complete that mission. We see very clearly it happened with the Father and the Son perfectly. And now the Father and the Son have sent the Spirit to live in our hearts and for us to be a kingdom of priests to God, to serve Him and represent Him to the world. And we do so in the power of the Spirit. And we have access to the Spirit because obviously He lives within us, but to His words that are God-breathed in the text of Scripture and the Bible you hold in your hands. And clearly another theme I think we see in this passage is the love of God. Because we all know we don't deserve this. If you ever think for a moment you deserve God's salvation, you're arrogant. It's a gift. At all times, we should be grateful. At all times, we should honor God and really be moved deeply. The fact that because of the thoughts we might have thought yesterday, God doesn't just strike us dead. We deserve hell. But God shows grace. God shows his love. We are justified by his blood as a gift. and We are spared from the wrath of God. So in conclusion, just a concluding statement for us tonight as we think This is responding in right worship to God. God is sovereign over all things, and the way in which he has revealed himself should bring us to worship him who is, who was, and who is to come. That should be our response to God. So, believer, I want to address you as a believer tonight. I think, like I just said, great rejoicing should really overwhelm you. You should be someone who rejoices in the salvation of our God. Not just the salvation that took place when he removed the penalty of sin in your life, but also we would say the daily salvation is taking place in your life in the sense from the, the salvation from the power of sin as you're diving into God's word and letting it shape and change you, as you're letting it mold you and you're taking it in. And what is it doing? God is delivering you from your flesh because you're putting your mind on the things of the Spirit, and that's life according to Romans 8, life and peace. But then one day we will be delivered from sin's presence, and that salvation is yet to come. We still experience sin. We hate the sin we see in our own hearts and in those around us and in the world. But we got to look to Christ. So this, this should bring rejoicing and hope for us. And the question we have to ask ourselves is, are you ready for Christ's return? You know, um, Lucas Shipman, if you know who that is, he's our D now speaker, a couple of year, last year and then a year before that. He visited church today, came by, and then they came over to our house. We had lunch, and I was telling him we were going through this series, and he just said, Man, that's, that's intimidating stuff, because then I feel like if we, I study Revelation, I have to land somewhere in eschatology. <laughs> I was like, yeah, pretty much. So, um, but he's just like, 
But I told him, I said, but it's such a blessing because you're sitting here and you're, you're reading this book says you'd be blessed in reading it. But in addition, you know, reading through all the verses of the New Testament that talk about being eager for Christ's return and to wanting Christ's return, it kind of reminds you, this is a major theme in the Bible we don't often talk about. We often reflect on the past, right? We reflect on being made right before God, our justification, but we don't often reflect on Christ coming again. All right? And I just want to encourage you guys, rejoice in that. You worship Christ, who's our faithful witness. He's the firstborn of the dead. He is the king, the ruler of all the earth. So rejoice in that. Maybe if you're an unbeliever tonight, you don't have a right relationship with God, would you rather wail at the coming of Christ out of fear of judgment or um, rather now wail over your sin and weep over the fact that your sin is separated from God? Maybe that's you today. I don't, I don't know. But have you ever had that conversion in your life? Have you ever repented and been changed because of the power of the gospel that Christ died for your sins, that he rose again from the grave according to the scriptures? And, and that gives you life. Notice uh, when Paul in, in Romans 1 talks about the gospel, he says, I am not ashamed of the gospel, for it, it, the gospel, it is the power of God. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. So I encourage you, if you don't believe in Christ today, or maybe you've grown up in church, you've heard it your whole life, you know, I don't know. But walk with Christ. Begin your relationship with him today. Uh, let me uh, pray for us, and the band will come sing another song, and then we'll, um, we'll pray together as a group, too. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We pray that we would respond rightly to your word tonight, that we'd worship you in spirit and truth, and that, God, as we think about your word, as we think about the, the power of the gospel and your sovereignty over our lives, that, God, we would respond in such a way that's pleasing to you. And, and God, I ask that for any of us who might be troubled, in our hearts, who might, we might be filled with fear, or um, maybe if someone in here is not a believer, that all of us would look to you, we turn to you, and we walk with you. Because you are sovereign, you are almighty, you are reliable, you are our priest, and you are our king. We love you, Jesus, and we praise your name. Amen.